All right. So let's go ahead and just get right on into this. So what I want to talk about first and foremost was some of the cybersecurity trends that we're seeing in 2021, right? Um, there's a lot of them out there, but I wanted to focus on, you know, five key ones because I think they're kind of interesting. First one being uh, how enterprise cybersecurity spending is going to increase as a result of COVID-19, how, how CISOs and CIOs are working to detangle and clutter their software assets, which is always a big problem for everybody. Third one's about or how organizations will increase cybersecurity budgets and staffing, and then vulnerability remediation, how it continues to be a struggle and uh, probably always will be a struggle. And then the last is the uh, intellectual property will mean a, remain a primary target. And um, I'm super interested in that one. And I know a lot of you probably are as well. If you have uh, you know, prod, if you're a product company or a software company, uh, you want to, that's your first and foremost thing that you're trying to do is protect your intellectual property. All right. And what I'm going to do is start off talking a little bit about um, the increased spending in, in some of these key industries here. And I picked the four top ones. And the first one is, you know, banking and finance. They, COVID impacted uh, the banking and the financial industries uh, predominantly because the government called upon the banking and financial industries to support government-led um, programs and initiatives that provided emergency funding to uh, loan uh, businesses in need and, and people in need, right? And we'll probably tend to see a lot of uh, trending in that direction as well, even though we aren't going to be in the, middle, in the midst of a large pandemic again. On the healthcare systems and services side, there was a lot of reform in the much-needed uh, telehealth and payment system uh, uh, functions, right? So uh, because people were uh, confined to their homes, the, the medical industry quickly found ways to be able to contact them through in platforms like Zoom and other types of platforms in order to be able to communicate with them so that they didn't have to come into to the hospitals and facilities like that. So I think that there's going to be a lot of additional um, maturity around that environment, as well as um, Everyone is aware of Operation Warp Speed, which is what the Trump administration did in order to, you know, speed up the vaccine developments. And I think that there's going to be a lot more spurring changes in uh, getting uh, clinical resort results as quickly as we've seen uh, with this uh, COVID pandemic. The other piece is around the public and the social sectors. There's definitely was a huge adoption for everybody around uh, working from not just from home, but working from anywhere. And then there's going to be a lot of movement around the digital transformation, which everybody's getting on, on the wave of the 5G, going to cloud, using artificial intelligence, and all those different platforms in, in order to improve uh, collaboration. And then the last piece uh, I'll mention is around technology and media and telecom, right? So I think what we're going to see there is they're going to be leveraging uh, growing product uh, placement like in-home um, entertainment, right? So I think all of us seen an explosion of all the different types of shows and media that you can see from your home. And certainly uh, there was probably a lot of sales around improving your home theater situation and things like that. There's going to be um, a lot of innovative products in the technology area around um, risk control as far as rapid testing. We saw for ourselves, you know, during COVID, how testing went from having to go into a clinic to actually going into drive up clinics and getting results pretty, pretty quickly. And then uh, last and not least is going to be a move towards more virtualized content and creation. And they're looking at really targeting customer groups. So different uh, generations of people targeting them with different types of, um, of media that they might be more interested in. The second um, topic is around how CIOs and CISOs will detangle and declutter software assets, right? Couldn't really find an appropriate picture, but I thought this is kind of how we feel, you know, as CISOs around the, the applications that if you're coming into a new company or a new organization, new position, you have to kind of get a handle on what's the baseline of the products that you're using. And I really think that, and I really recommend if, you, if you're not already doing it, if you haven't already done it, that you do kind of get a, a baseline of what are the products that you have? What's their capabilities? Um, do you have overlapping capabilities? Are there things that are better 
products that are better than the other so that you can then eliminate some duplicity that you have there. And then also you need to identify, you know, what your gaps are. So I think there's a lot of organizations that are, are doing these type of activities right now. And then I'll get into it a little more. I'll talk a little bit about the solar winds breach later on, but I think it's important to know that as we continue to uh, have incidents with our supply chain and with vendors that we've trusted that you develop, if you don't have it already, you know, develop a really thorough review process of your, of your vendors that you're, that you're using, right? So in the defense space, we go in pretty deep detail on these things. So we don't just use the Gartner, you know, high and right magic quadrant, what's the best products to use, but we also take a look at the products that are usually, you know, made in the USA that don't have, uh, code that's developed in in other countries like you know, China and other places that we really wouldn't like to have that code in our products, right? So we go as far in the defense industry to take a look at where did their where does their investment money come from, who sits on their boards and things like that, because that will have a lot of influence on the vendors and their products as well. The third uh, the third category is organizations will increase cybersecurity budgets and staffing. So I think that there's a lot of data out there as I was, you know, kind of studying up for this. I read tons of articles around how, you know, not just because, not just because of COVID, but certainly the COVID, COVID was the propellant for, uh, it says there that 70% of organizations have increased their cybersecurity spending. And as I was reading all these articles, I was looking at some of the things that they were, they were doing, right? So around identity and access management, certainly if people are no longer setting, you know, on-prem in your you know, protected networked environment and they're working from home or they're working from a coffee shop or wherever it is that they choose to work from, that, that, that what's first and foremost important is that they have, they have, you know, the identities are, are proper and protected and trusted and that you only allow those type of the protected, you know, trusted identities into your environment as well. A uh, big thing was secure remote access. A lot of companies went from being totally on-prem and having people that had, you know, tabletop, desktop computers to them having to get, you know, uh, laptops sent out them out to them. And then how do you secure that properly? How do you get the proper AOVPN spun up, uh, you know, in order to make sure that their connectivity is secure back to your, uh, to your network, right? There's endpoint security. Talk, talk a little bit about that. That's super important. Multi-factor authentication. To me, that's one of the key things that you need to have. And a lot of companies, believe it or not, because they were setting on-prem, did not have multi-factor authentication. And to me, that's one of the, the you know, most important things. Once you've sent out your secure laptops to your employees in order to work remotely, certainly you need to uh, send out the multi-factor authentication capability so that, that that's how they're getting in. Um, there's other things that are a lot of CISOs are focusing on, which is the zero trust model again, because your your environment is your is out there on the edge, and it's in so many different locations and different devices that people are using. You really have to have a zero trust model where we're you're trusting the identity of the people and the devices that you're allowing in, and that you're also using a least trust model as well, as far as giving them the least privileges that they need to see the data inside your environment, right? And then the other piece is the monitoring of all the different devices that you have in your environment, no matter where they're at, making sure that they are, you always have, you're, you're scrutinizing and know what they're doing. Um, a lot of larger companies, you know, like SAIC and others out there, I can tell when somebody has taken the device to another country and it tries to pop up on the network and it might not be, they might not be authorized to do that. So, uh, you need to have good eyes on what's happening with your with your devices, right? Which has your customer data usually on it. Other pieces of that are, um, again, a lot of companies have gone from being on-prem, maybe some of them in the cloud, but what we're working with a lot now is is uh, hybrid environments. And that's, that's really important to be able to control in both all the different environments that you're gonna be in. And then, um, what I thought was pretty interesting is a study from PwC has said that 55% of enterprise executives plan to increase their cybersecurity budgets in 2021, and 51% are also adding full-time, you know, full-time or more cyber staff. So uh, definitely cyber, usually you see cyber get a big bounce in a company when there's been a large compromise, especially if it's a public compromise. Uh, usually those are the best companies to go work for after a big breach because they're doing all the right things to protect their environment and have a lot of, you know, good cyber hygiene practices going in place. And I think that uh, this COVID 
um, has absolutely impacted our industry. And I think um, it, it's been a bad thing for us as a as a as actually globally, but it's been a, a good bounce for us in cybersecurity. All right, vulnerability remediation. So all of us here, this is like a no-brainer, right? Uh, vulnerability remediation is always a struggle. It's always everybody uh, has to do their day jobs before they do these type of activities, unless you're in an organization that is uh, large enough that it has people who do just this, but typically we're not in that type of a situation, right? So what's really important to note about vulnerabilities, and of course, I'll talk, like I said, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, you know, the solar winds breach, but the uh, the shelf life for vulnerabilities is very long, right? It's, there's an estimate there I have, it's about seven years, right? That, that bad actors are still exploiting vulnerabilities that have been out there for years and years. And then I have a note here, this particular CVE, one of my guys found is that uh, SAP was, uh, exploited with an 11-year-old vulnerability, right? Anyways, um, I've got a question here, which I'll answer in just a second. Let me just finish this piece. But anyways, um, mitigating and eliminating vulnerabilities reduces your uh, exposure, um, you know, significantly. And I feel like I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but it is to me one of the most important things that I do as a CISO first is that, you know, the protection it used to be when we were all on prem, it was our, it was our firewall and protecting everything. And to me now it's really the vulnerability piece because that's how companies are, are getting exposed. So I will stop for a second because I do want to try to answer questions. I want this to be relevant to everybody here in the audience. And, and Dave says, um, you mentioned CIOs and CISOs will need to detangle their estate and simplify their assets. Do you think these two roles need special coaching and how to collaborate with each other? Or generally, are they already collaborating well? You know what? That's a really good question. And I would say, I'm not an attorney, but I would all, I would answer with, a, you know, that's an, it depends, right? There are realignments happening with where CISO set a lot, and, you know, back in, you know, older days, uh, you know, CISO set under the CIO. So I think that there would be a good collaboration there if you're natively setting under the CIO. Now, a lot of times CISOs report to the chief, chief risk officer or general counsel or even the CEO. So we're seeing a big shift in that, but either way, the CIO and the CISO need to be partners, right? And and it doesn't matter where you sit, you have to be, you know, kind of in lockstep with everything that you're doing. And, and quite frankly, you know, um, if you don't have a good relationship with the CIO and you're not working together to develop the CIO's roadmap, like a, a CIO shouldn't be developing a roadmap without CISO input to make sure that they're picking products and are going to solutions that that can be secured properly, right? Then you're you're not you're not working and you're not aligned together. So, uh, great question, and I think that depending upon where you set and uh, and if you report or don't report or if you don't get along or whatever it is, you, you need to work through all that because it's really key that the CIO and the CISO do collaborate together. So that was a great question, and I think that um, that that ability to do that really will be how successful that your company is going to be as well too. All right. So here's my favorite part to talk about is the intellectual property piece because I do set in a defense contracting company and I did spend so many so much time in the defense industrial based space and in the in the in the DoD. This is the kind of things that, you know, I grew up learning about and talking about, and it's still significant today, right? And what I'm showing here is if you look on the left there, that is our United States Navy littoral combat ship, right? It's a small surface vessel, does near shore operations. And what's really cool about this ship, which I don't have a picture of it, but if you look, if you turn the back of the ship, you would see what's called a trimarian hull. So there's three hulls there, and it makes it really uh, more stable when they're conducting really fast maneuvers and have to turn really quickly. You know, you don't you don't um, capsize and things like that, right? And if you see the picture on the right there, it's the Chinese salvage and rescue ship, and they have a lot of these trimarian hull ships in their navy now. Their navy is actually almost very identical to ours in this smaller class ship because they've they've actually stolen the intellectual property not necessarily from the United States government, from the the uh, contractors who are building these type of products for our, for our military services right so it is it's a shame but uh china is you know we're trying to be you know 
friends with everybody in the world, but actually, you know, China isn't our friend when it comes to our, our military strategy and their military strategy and their national strategy is to be the number one superpower in the world and to unseat the United States. And they're doing a lot of heavy, um, in, you know, um, active advanced persistent threat techniques around um, stealing the data from the Defense Department's um, contractors who support them in developing these things. All right, so I have another question there. It says, have you seen a rise in insider threat during COVID? So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on, but um, I, I, typically, I don't really have the statistics on that, but I think that to answer your question is that it's a very ignored uh, threat in most companies as far as um, companies don't take pay as much attention to their inside threats as they do the advanced persistent threat that I'm talking about, like right here with China, right? All right. So showing you another one, this is our, you know, on top is our F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. And on the bottom, you see the Chinese J-31. And it is the exact same, you know, architecture, everything that's in it. What's interesting to note um, is that sometimes they didn't get the designs for like a specific function of the aircraft. So there might be a button and they put the button in there, but even though they don't even know what the button was for, or what it was supposed to do, but it, but the Chinese, you know, copy things so, you know, impeccably that they even put in buttons that don't even have any function. So there's a lot of that going on. And there's other things to worry about too, when we're looking at our weapon system platforms being taken from us, right? They're getting, what they're doing is they're stealing all of our research and development and all the years and all the billions of dollars that we spent to go into there, they into it, they they are getting it for free just by taking it, right? So they're saving a lot of money. They're speeding up their own R and D. They don't even have to do it. They just take what the United States has. So so big problems. I see a question on CMMC. Um, I'll I'll talk about that uh, at, at a little little bit further along in the briefing, just so I make sure that I hit that for you all. All right. So this is a forum. The World Economic Forum, and um, I I love to read their research. Right, it uh, every year they put out a new document. It's usually in January, and they what this forum does is it looks at what are the issues across the world, and then you know how can we work together globally to you know work on some of these issues. But I really like the the 2020 report from last year because it it's the one that mentioned the new the next wave as the the fourth IR, which is the fourth industrial revolution, and talks about how technology is going to dramatically, you know, reshape products. It's going to reshape, you know, the global economy, societies, and all this other kind of stuff. So it's pretty, it's, to me, it's pretty interesting. And um, I wanted to delve into that just a little bit, just to get you guys uh, a little taste of what's, uh, what's happening there. So first, I thought this would be interesting to note, right? So there's, just think about this, there's 7.86 billion people in the world Already, 5.27 billion have mobile phones. That's pretty significant, right? And I believe that this these numbers are like increasing exponentially each year. How many people are using the internet? 4.66 billion. And then for you social media users, the younger generation out there, there's you know 4.2 billion users on uh, on social media. But what's interesting to note: 50% of the world population is on the internet already. One million additional people join the internet every single day. So there is this huge explosion and proliferation of technology, and it's going to the furthest reaches of the world, right? And with that, I guess I, I don't even need to say it, but I'm just going to footstomp it, that as all these technology advances happen, it just makes our job as cyber experts harder and harder to protect, right? And we're going to get more into all that. All right, so I thought this was pretty cool to show, right? So there's a lot of um, vehicles that are autonomous. That means there's no driver in them, right? And the two on the left, those are those are conceptual vehicles. Uh, I do believe the guy that's sitting in that Mercedes there is actually sitting in a real, um, you know, a real prototype vehicle there. So just imagine this, you know, today you go into a dealership and you're buying a driver, your vehicle that you drive, and I can't even. And even though I see this stuff, I can't even fathom going in there and buying a vehicle that you just set in and you don't even drive it yourself. But the times it's coming, right? And the picture there on the top right, it has the Chinese uh, Beidou 
Apollo driverless taxi. I just read an article this weekend that they went live with their services. So the, the level four or five is the different l- levels that they're doing with their autonomous uh, driverless taxi, right? And a level four means that, I think it means that there is a, not a driver sitting in the driver's seat, but they are sitting in the, the passenger seat in the front, just in case any sort of, you know, to pre- prevent any sort of accident, that's where they're at right now. And then on the level five piece is the is a payment piece. So they're actually, people are actually in China right now paying to be in these driverless vehicles and they are accepting payment and and things like that. So it's coming. And then I have a little note there that by 2025 and think about it, like we're already halfway through 2021 already. So in less than four and a half years, there's going to be approximately 8 million autonomous or semi-autonomous vehicles on the road. Quite an achievement. The next piece that just gets more exciting to me as is, is, is we talk about this, but is around artificial intelligence. So from, you know, reactive ro- robots to self-aware beings, right? And one of my favorite shows ever, obviously, is The Terminator. And there's a picture of the Cyberdyne Systems Model 101, right? And what, what's interesting is that back in the day when the first Terminator was being, um, you know, filmed, this Cyberdyne model was actually more CGI. It wasn't actually a functioning robot, but as all the different um, sequels went on, it became more and more actual artificial intelligence involved as well as the CGI piece, right? So that's kind of interesting note. The picture there in the middle is the, um, this is is the future astronaut. This is a robotic astronaut that NASA is developing in partnership with MIT and it's called Valkyrie. So just think about that. Like we can save humans uh, in this space exploration. We can save lives by sending these types of robots into into space uh, in the future and uh, still be able to achieve, I think the objectives of what we're trying to achieve to see what's out there and to get samples and all the different experiments that they do. But that's pretty interesting that we're that we're already starting to see that we're getting to that level of competency with these type of of robots. And then the one on the right, I'm sure a lot of you have already seen as well, because it was all over YouTube about a couple months back. But this is the Boston Dynamics Atlas robot. This thing actually doesn't just like stand up and walk. This thing runs and it jumps over. I just got a little picture of jumping over a wall there, but it actually jumps up onto things, uh, onto uh, platforms and such and jumps back off. So it's getting very advanced in those areas. And uh, and I just, uh, I couldn't even imagine if I was a CISO of a company that developed a product like that. Look at all the technology that's in that and how do you protect that to make sure that it doesn't get you know compromised and taken over by a bad threat actor. All right. Wanted to, for all of you out there, I know we're all in different industries, but for the healthcare industries, there's a ton of information on the advances in smart technology and how, you know, it's going to improve our our quality of life and and health and all that in the future, right? And I got a picture there of, this is the old style, you know, prosthetic there. And uh, I I don't want to say how old I am, but I truly remember somebody have, wearing one similar to that, uh, maybe not as old, but similar to that, you know, and it really wasn't functioning. It was just more to give balance to the person and such. And now we're moving into things like if you look there, 3D, pen, 3D printing for a custom fit for a prosthetic, right? And uh, the one on the bottom left, uh, there's that is actually a bionic prosthetic, right? And so coming from the military, I've read a lot about our our guys and the mil- guys and gals in the military who've had, you know, horrendous uh, injuries and they've, you know, lost a limb. And there is a lot of technology going into these uh, bionic prosthetics so that a person could actually, like with that hand there, I didn't read all the details of it, but a person could actually put, you know, pounds per, per inch onto something to be able to like pick up objects and they can hold them properly up to almost 50 pounds. So I think it's uh, interesting to note that they will try to improve uh, people's lives where they can still continue to do things that they did before they lost their, uh, their arms or legs. And then the other pieces around uh, wireless connectivity for, you know, diagnostic monitoring, you know, not necessarily having to, um, go into surgery and look into somebody, there's all kinds of new technology around diagnostics. And what I have there on the bottom right is actually a pacemaker. And just, you know, thinking about all these different types of technologies, a lot of them have electronics on them. And a lot of them have 
are meant to be monitored. And so how do you protect, you know, items like that? All right, and the last piece around uh, what I got out of economic forum <clears throat> is around the different advances that we have in the agricultural area, right? So if you look there on the left, we have the almanac. We still have the farmer's almanac. So it still has a lot of good data in it. And I don't even know how they could figure that stuff out back in those days, but it's pretty interesting that they could like when to water, when to plant and all that kind of stuff. And now here we have satellites, you know, hundreds of satellites are working together around the world to provide images like you see here, or, and in, in particular, I think it would be interesting in areas like in the in the Middle Eastern countries where the temperatures reach 120 every day, and in you know Africa and those places where they can take a look with the, the satellites and download to the farmers in those areas where their spots are where they are in need of irrigation before the other the other areas. So all pretty interesting stuff, and you know, just even hard to fathom that we have stuff like this today. All right, so all that great technology, and I don't trust me, I only hit like a little drop in the bucket on on what's out there. To me, it's like super exciting to see, you know, what's going on there. But what comes with that is all the unintended consequences of having these type of technologies, uh, intellectual property. How do you secure them? And one thing that's happening is that the more advanced we get, it seems like the uh, Cyber attacks are increasing, you know, on a daily basis. And I do have a note there that says that uh, cybersecurity experts predict in 2021 there's going to be a cyber incident every 11 seconds. And it, you know, there is data out there. It's between 11 and and 25 or 30 seconds. But either way, that's still a lot of cyber incidents happening, right? So we have so much to defend. The more that we increase our our technology in all the different areas that of life that we deal with. All right, so with all this new technology, all of it's spitting out data, collecting data, holding data, and things like that. So we definitely have a data expansive, uh, you know, expansion challenge here in uh, 2021, right? So it's everywhere. Uh, you know, it's on what used to be on-prem. Now it's you have SaaS products, cloud products. Uh, it's in devices. It, it's on people's endpoints. It's everywhere. Uh, even here at, you know, at SAIC, we, we're dealing with, you know, how much data that we're ingesting on a daily basis and people have, companies have databases, data lakes, data warehouses, and now we have a, a chief uh, data officer at SAIC even coined the phrase, you know, data lake houses. So there's all kinds of, you know, interesting aspects of maturity going on around that. So I think what's interesting to note here is that I wanted to get some statistics always just to show how things are going, right? But it says that there are 2.5 quintillion bytes of data being created every day, right? So 2.5 quintillion. So I did the math. No, actually, I didn't do the math. I actually counted the zeros because that's the only way to do it, right? So um, there, quintillion is eight zeros bigger than billions, right? So that's a lot of data that's being created every single day. And um, the note is, is that 90% of the world's data has been created in the last two years alone. So there is a proliferation and a definite explosion of that going on, right? And it's expected to double uh, every two years as well. So uh, as, as cyber people, we have, you know, our, our, roles and responsibilities are first and foremost to protect our company data and to protect our customer data. And then it's just, it's only going to get, you know, more difficult. All right. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the different types of threats that are out there too. So everybody has an understanding and I'm sure that y'all do. So don't want to insult you or anything, but the one that, you know, in my industry, in the defense industry, which I talked a little bit about is the nation state type actors that are out there. So those are called advanced persistent threats. These are, these are bad actors that are actually funded by uh, the countries that they're performing all their activities out of. And so the ones that we take a look and, and uh, watch the most are obviously the Chinese, the Russians, the North Koreans, and the Iranians. They're always doing something to try to not, they're not so much doing things to disrupt operations. They are doing that, but they're doing it more for their own gain to see, to get our data, like I showed you around getting 
weapon system platform so they don't have to develop in themselves and to, you know, the Russians do more along the what is the political agenda of the U.S. government. They try to get data around that. Right. So um, their goals are definitely uh, stealing the sensitive data for the intellectual property and sometimes to do take political action with. Right. The second type, which we already had a, a question about, is the insider threat, right? That's the malicious person inside the inside the company that they are purposefully, knowingly, um, not so much sometimes sabotage, but usually it's more along trying to exfil the data so that they can take it and uh, and sell it. And um, and then there's also uh, an insider threat, which. I call it an insider threat myself is around employee error. While they're not doing things on purpose, they have elevated privileges and they do things that they shouldn't be doing, or they do something accidentally with their elevated privileges and it, you know, knocks systems out and takes uh, operational systems down. There's all kinds of things that they can do there. But as far as um, I think I tried to put a lot into the answer around the um, insider threat piece, as far as, is it happening more during COVID? I, you know, I really don't know the answer to that, but I would, I could Google up and and get it to you and let you know. And then the third third one that I'm mentioning, there's other types of you know criminals out there. You know, there's is the organized crime piece or the or the cyber criminal piece, and that they have a big impact on us and all companies. And uh, and our healthcare is is particularly a focus of the cyber criminals as well as the financial and banking industry because they're the ones that's typically getting into the environment and they're trying to um, see where your data is and they are what they're doing now is they have really advanced techniques that they're using they're actually exfiltrating the data so that you don't even know that it's going out before they lock down your environment right because what they're going to do is they're going to want to ransom from companies and um uh, I think I have some more data on that, but uh, typically it's, um, you know, companies weren't paying the ransom. So because they could bring back up their data from their, uh, you know, backups that they had. And so the ransomware, you know, bad criminals are getting, you know, smart to deal with that. So that's the reason why they're exfilling the data and they're basically holding it hostage for you to pay them. Or if you don't pay them, they'll just dump it on the dark web, right? So nobody, no companies want their data out there, but that is absolutely a technique that they're using. So around the solar winds attack, this was, um, to me, this was uh, a kind of uh, what they call a black swan, right? Nobody saw this coming. I mean, people had had talked about it before that it put, might happen, but nobody really paid it any mind. But certainly when FireEye, Kevin Mandia came out and announced that his company had been compromised uh, by a threat actor, Russia, it was called Nobelium. It's now called Nobelium. But um, he attributed it to the solar winds product that they were using, right? So he knew before anybody else what had happened because he's actually an authority on cybersecurity and quite good at it and, and, de and detected it before anybody else, right? So what's, Im what's important about it, though, is that it was super eye-opening, not for many reasons. One is that it impacted, you know, SolarWinds had 33,000 customers. They think 18,000 had the malware, had the software that had the malware in it. And then there was a very specific number of targeted companies that actually were targeted by this Russian APT uh, for specific reasons that we talked about that APTs, nation states, uh, get into uh, companies' uh, data and proprietary data, right? But what's interesting about for the rest of us is that kind of put a distrust in our minds about our software products and vendors, right? That that how do you prevent this from happening, right? So what I talked about at the beginning as far as, as, far as having a very robust way to review your vendors is if you don't have it now, you should get it in place because it's going to become very important in the future. All right, real quickly, this is a little bit about the, the types of consequences for a data breach and what you'll see, it'll impact you everything from strategic to operational. And I think what's good to know is that it takes you a long time basically to build a reputation and with a cyber incident, it only takes you a few minutes to lose it, right? So that's super important. And that's what makes our jobs as cyber experts so, so critical. But in uh, 2020, the number of breaches in the United States that was reported was 1,001. And then if you look at, I looked at some statistics from last year and in 2019, there was actually, you know, four times as many incidents. It doesn't mean that the number of data breaches have gone down. It just means that 
companies are not reporting these data breaches unless they absolutely have to, right? So if it's if they've impacted you know millions of customers, they have to disclose that it has to become public. But a lot of companies they're not even uh, you know disclosing that they've been breached, so it's hard to get the actual data on that. All right, and then here's some information around the, the cost of data breach by industry. And I put this on here just so all of you who have different industries, you might take a look at that. And it's also interesting to note that average is really, and I'm air quoting average, is really is an average because you know when Equifax was breached, it was several years back, they spent over $4 billion to recover from their breach. So that is, is pretty significant. And I would say that uh, probably the larger company you are and uh, you know, uh, more money you make, it's definitely going to grow exponentially, right? So this is, it is, again, is just an average. All right. So some of the things I wanted to talk about, there is, um, you know, all that, it seems, it's, it's, it's exciting that we have all these different types of technological innovations and, you know, all this stuff that's going on. So I think it's super interesting. Um, but the, the thing is, is to me, it could be, you know, scary for us cyber folks, right? So especially if you're a CISO of a large company and everybody's looking at you to always do the right thing and always know what to do, right? It to me, it's a little bit scary. But one of the things that I basically do is I've I've um, put whatever everything that I do into these four uh, guiding principle areas, right? Awareness, compliance, defense, and communication. I'm going to talk a little bit about each one. Now, just keep in mind that you know all the different types of technologies that. Uh, I showed you here today, there's obviously a lot more deeper security controls and techniques that you have to use in order to secure those kind of products. But for the average, for the average company in the defense space or health space or whatever it is, I think these four things are pretty, you do these things and you're going to do the, you're going to have a 90% 90, 90 you know, best effort in place and it'll keep most you know, bad actors out. So the first thing is, is awareness of what your environment looks like, right? Establishing this a visibility across all the different environments that we talked about. You know, your environment's not just on prem anymore. It's where your employees are working. It's where your employees are working on customer sites and you have enclaves and you have all these other kinds of things going on. And you need to be aware of all those and you need to have plans for how do you secure data in all those different environments, right? Um, there are some things that it's a a lot of companies are doing now is around how do you prioritize your effort, right? You only have so many resources and how do you, if you're a company that has several thousand programs and projects going on, how do you prioritize where to put your limited number of resources, right? So a lot of companies have what's called a crown jewel program or a most notable call them something else. But what you're trying to do is you're supposed, you're trying to look at the risk all those programs have, which has which are the ones most important to the company? It could be financially most important. It could be because the criticality of the data. It could be the criticality of the customer who you don't want to lose. All these different criteria go into it. And you need to really establish something like that so that you can focus your resources and prioritize your level of effort towards the ones in that priority list. You don't exclude everything else, but you definitely focus on your most important things, right? Um, another thing that we run across too a lot as cyber professionals is that there's a lot of projects and programs and they have contracts and they don't even know what their own contracts state that the security levels need to be in the projects or programs that they're doing for customers. So it's real important to make sure that you drive an awareness into your, uh, you know, your PMs, what it is in their contract that they should be adhering to and how they should be configuring uh, the solutions for their customers and making sure they're meeting everything that's in their in their contracts, all their contractual obligations, right? And one thing I do as a defense CISO is we do have system security plans for every single program. It doesn't matter, right? If you're in a secure environment or not, um, creating a system security plan makes the programs look at all the different uh, processes they go through and making sure that they secure them as 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 uh, best they can. The second piece is around defense. To me, you know, obviously we spend probably most of our time in our day around the defense piece and then trying to get ahead of the attackers, which is really getting harder and harder to do. And what I use at, at my company is a threat informed defense, right? So the more you know about what's going on in the wild, what is being exploited today, what's the are there zero days dropping today? The more you know about what's happening, then you can take that intelligence and you can under if you understand 
what's going on in your own environment, like we talked about, and also down to what's in your inventory. What are all your devices that you have? What are all your endpoints? Where are they all at? And understanding the health of them, understanding, you know, have they been patched? Have they not been patched? You take that and you fuse it all together. So you're looking at what's happening in the wild. What do I have in my space? Is what's happening in the wild exploiting something that I have? Okay, yes, I have this device. And has it been patched? And, you know, is it up to date with, you know, the the software versions that it needs to be and all that, right? And so you can quickly wave off if you have an issue or if you don't have an issue, right? And if you happen to see things that are happening in the wild and you have those devices in your environment and they haven't been patched and you immediately, all hands on deck, get your focus on, you know, uh, working on those uh, devices that need to be secured, remediated immediately and uh, and get your environment healthy, right? We do that through, you know, numerous ways with security operations centers, cyber threat intelligence centers and all those type of things. And obviously implementing uh, other models that I've talked about a little bit earlier. All right, third piece is around compliance, right? Um, not compliance from compliance, but doing compliance because you're meeting security controls that you need to meet in order for, you know, for your customer or for your industry. So as far as uh, here's a piece around CMMC, right? In the defense space, <clears throat> we used to have just NIST ANR 171 compliance. Now we've moved to because of the reasons I showed you, because in the defense industrial space, industrial based space, so many companies have been compromised, obviously, hence why China's flying, you know, jets that look like our F-35 and why they have Navy ships that look like our littoral ships, right, is because they've been taken from, from the companies that support the, the Department of Defense, right? So cyber maturity model certification is a way to enforce on the defense contracting companies and other companies that are supplying uh, parts and services to the government as well, right? To get to a healthy cyber hygiene. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you wanted me to talk about it, specifically about that, but that is a particular framework that is used in the Department of Defense. And for the health industry, it's it's HIPAA, which is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And in the uh, financial industry, it's the PCI DSS, which is the payment card industry data security standards. So a whole list of other, you know, acronyms there for all the different industries that you're in. But to me as a CISO, if you do not have a framework and you are running security for any company, no matter how big or small you are, that is negligent, right? You need to have something to baseline from and to make sure that you're putting the proper controls in place. Just if you don't have one for your industry, pick one, pick pick ISO. I've, I've got buddies who are in the financial industry who they're not mandated to use NIST 8171 or the CMC controls, but they use them because they're good, right? So, so make sure that you do that. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next slide. And the last piece, to me, uh, communication is, uh, is the hardest part of what security professionals do, right? I think it's the hardest part of, my, of what I do as well, because you're trying to create a culture of cybersecurity in whatever organization you're in or in your company, right? And the only way to do that is through communication and, and making sure that you're training people and making them aware of the things that they need to know, right? So I hope I'm not, you know, preaching to the choir here, but you definitely need to communicate through mandatory training. And, you know, in the defense space, we have hours of mandatory training that we have to give our employees to make sure that they're ready to handle the, the customer data. And, and handle it properly. So we have that. And, it, and if you don't have mandates on you, you probably definitely should have at least an hour or more of training a year for your employees just to give them refresher. And it could be things like, you know, all kinds of things, but definitely around um, it, phishing training, how to spot a fish, because a lot of companies, that's the initial entryway for them to get breached is through phishing. So, you know, training your employees on stuff like that, right? Um, the other piece is um, you have um, you have employees that are everywhere. They're not not all, not all sitting inside your environment on prem. They're off a lot of times. They are off on customer sites, and you still have to communicate with them. And then there's others where you are kind of a split, where you're running the customers' environment in our environment, and you, you know. So there's just a lot of ways that you have to communicate with people. And sometimes there's employees that are way out there on customer sites. They're not reading your corporate email. So come up with you know creative ways. Uh, 
You can go back to the old school days of, you know, sending them a mailing once a quarter or once a year. You can, you know, if you're super innovative and advanced company, you can, you can tweet to them or you can, you know, text them, send them texts and things like that. But it's important that you communicate with them at all times, you know, in, especially in, in emergency times. Like we've had so much happen with after the solar winds breach, if you had projects and programs that were using solar, you know, the, the solar winds, uh, you know, software or had servers running themselves, you know, you had to communicate with them immediately to let them know you needed to, to, to uh, block your external entry so that you could get a handle on it and remediate things, right? So communicating that there's a tons, always Microsoft exchange things happening, you know, um, we've had Pulse Secure drop, you know, recently. So there's something always, always dropping and there's probably always people employees in your companies that are having to get that information so that they can take immediate action as well, right? And the, the other big thing is making your cybersecurity team or your security team or whatever resources you have accessible to the people in the company, right? So um, do that in, in different ways. I do something, you know, we, always, we have queues, we have mailboxes they can send stuff to. And then I also have a Yo Cyber number. So it's, it's da, da 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 Yo Cyber, and they call that and they get a phone. Somebody answers a phone 24 7 so that we can see if there's something going on out there and we can take immediate action on it. Right. And then, um, yeah, so definitely I think it's the most important thing that we do because security, security teams are so generally pretty small and you're not doing it, you're not doing it for the entire company. You're having to use the, the employees of the company as full force multipliers to help you do your job, right? And it's everybody's job in a company nowadays to do the right thing and to be to be security um, experts as well. So that was kind of fast and furious, but I did want to get through all that. And I hope hopefully it was uh, enlightening and a little bit helpful that maybe you could take some golden nuggets away here. But I think that um, our, in our industry, things are always going to be moving rapidly. It's going to be um, exciting new innovations and technologies are uh, going to be coming our way and we're going to be uh, struggling with how to secure everything. But I think with those those four takeaways, those four um, models to um, follow are just, you know, basic cyber hygiene. And to me, just doing the basic cyber hygiene, the basic block and tackling of your defense and you know, patching your vulnerabilities, updating your software, and um, just doing those basic things, good privileged account management, multi-factor authentication, all that, that keeps 90% of the bad guys out. So the rest you, you can focus your attention and your brain power on to secure these pacemakers and such that we have, you know, coming out today. So with that, and I love Ragnar Lofbrook. So the world is changing and we must change with it. So that's absolutely the case. Kim. Okay. That did was, I make it? You did. And we have four minutes to spare, but I love what you talked about with the cybersecurity teams being so small and how do you educate the rest of the companies? And we talk mm -hmm. about that a lot on my um, and security for all voice America show. So I am going to be trying to get you on that show. Cause I would love to talk about that some more. We don't have sure. enough time to talk about that this hour. We have a few questions. Um, let's see if we can get them in. This platform does cut us off when we're at time, but uh, Jatendra asks any thoughts on CMMC. So I did talk a little bit about that. If she could put her specific question in there, I would be more than happy to answer it. Okay. I, I do know a lot about CMMC. So. Yeah, and, and he is, he, I think he's the CISO or CTO for the state of Maryland. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, well, hopefully I hit it, Jatendra, and, as far yeah, as and, even and if you're not mandated by anybody in your state to tell you what to do, I think it's a good framework to follow. So, it actually took NIST 8171 and it took uh, some, some CSIS and other 800 53 controls as well. So, it's a, it's a good compilation of good cyber security controls recommend doing it. I had somebody that said, you mentioned uh, CIOs and CISOs, we need to detangle their estate and simplify their assets. Do you think that these two roles need special coaching on how to yeah. collaborate with each other or generally are they already collaborating well? I think I talked a lot about that. I, I think I answered it as best I could. And it's a 
it's a definite must, right? So definitely CIOs and CISOs have to be, you know, attached at the hip and you need to have a really good relation, a good, strong working relationship. And, and I know that sometimes it's difficult, you're at competing odds, but it's, it's, it's able to happen. You can do it. So sorry, I did repeat that. Linda okay. said, um, Linda, coat here, very interesting, eye-opening on how much data is out there and number of devices, the internet, cell phones, et cetera. Good, great info. Um, Jatinder said you did answer that. Um, thank you. Uh, sorry, I'm over here. I have Aunt Moid said, do we expect third parties we're using to have the same maturity and security? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. So definitely, you know, in the defense space, and I think in any space that if you have to, you have to have a high expectation for your suppliers and your vendors, just like you do for yourself, right? Because that's your supply chain is your weakest, it's your underbelly. So they're, your supply chain is the ones who the bad actors come through, right? So I would say the answer is yes, but, but be not across the board, they don't all have to have the same level, right? So if we're flowing down what we call in the in the Department of Defense area, controlled unclassified information, QE information to a vendor, we expect them to be at the same control levels that the government requires us to be at. So we flow down the controls that we tell them that they need to meet in order to handle that QE information because it has to be protected at all levels. So there is an expectation, yes. So. Uh, Wolf asked, when do you think the Microsoft company will sunset exchange in favor of O365? Yeah, that's a great question. And they're, trust me, they're working hard to do it because they want to get everybody into that product. But the, 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 they have to keep, they have to keep their Microsoft products because there's a lot of companies that are on-prem. Some companies don't ever plan to go to the cloud because they consider on-prem way more secure, right? And then there's also contracts that, if you're working with the government or the federal agencies, there are some contracts that they they do not allow you to go to the cloud, so you still have to be on-prem as well. So uh, Microsoft would love to push the whole world onto their platform, you know, to their O365, M365, uh, but they're not going to be able to do it because of it, not everybody can come that come there. And we'll take one more question because um, they're all coming in fast. David, to what degree? has the need for culture change shifted in the time of COVID and post-COVID? I'm assuming he means culture change around cyber, right? So I'm assuming uh, so. Yeah, okay. so I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that question. So definitely I believe COVID's been an eye opener and for a lot of companies uh, like SAIC has been operating with people off premise remote workers. So we already had established uh, methods to do that. A lot of companies didn't. They were all on prem and then they had to push them out, right? So I think that the security piece is becoming more an everyday uh, discussion around how do you continue to work from home? You know, if you're locked out, it's obvious because there's been a security breach or something like that. So it's important to all companies now, I think, and it's definitely more prevalent now. So yeah, the answer is yeah. So everyone, Alicia Lynch, Vice President, Chief Information Security Officer from SAIC. Thank you very much. There was some great information, probably not enough time to put out there. Really wasn't. Nope. Yeah, well, I definitely <laughs> would love to have you back. Love to have you on the show. Um, I, I do my Voice America show live every, uh, every Friday. So love to carry on this conversation. For those of you that would like to find Alicia, I'm sure you can find her on LinkedIn because that's where I found her. So, um, <laughs> and she will be, she'll be on the platform. So if you go over to the network lounge and you have any other questions, you can shoot any questions through the message center there. It will go to our inbox anyway. I'm assuming that's okay with you, Alicia. Oh, absolutely. Happy to help. Yeah. Okay. 100%. Well, thank you so much for being here and we look forward to having you back another day couple quick announcements.